Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm with Mr. Universe and biomechanics expert, Doug Brignoli. Doug, how you doing? Hey Mo, how are you? Very good, thank you. Today we're going to talk about studies and exercise comparisons. Okay. So we often hear this group performed this exercise for a certain time versus this one, and then the, this is the result. So we wanna see if these uh, studies are really accurate. Mm -hmm. So before we do that, what makes an exercise a good exercise and what makes an exercise a bad exercise? Well, that's a biomechanical question, right? That's what we talk about in the Brig 20. And that's what we talk about in Smart Training 365 is the 15 factors that determine whether or not that exercise is in full compliance with the requirements that designate it as a good exercise or not, right? You could, you could come up with a similar checklist for, let's say, the aviation principles, right? The, the flight worthiness of an airplane, right? If the wingspan isn't this long for a plane that weighs this much, it's compromised, right? So likewise, when it comes to an exercise, if you don't have full range of motion, or you don't have alignment, or you don't have early phase loading, or you don't have uh, an absence of reciprocal innervation, if these factors are not met, if, there, if, if, if there's something is, is missing from these 15 factors on this exercise, then it will lose, 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 lose value. So if it misses only one or two, okay. If it misses three or four, not so good. If it misses five or six, we're still, right? So um, this is why our program is so valuable is because it is literally a checklist that you have in your hands. You can look at it, you can say, all right, here's my checklist that I got from Smart Training 365 from Doug Brignoli and Mo, right? This is, I can look at this exercise now and say, is that full range of motion? Is that early phase loading? Is there alignment? Is there this, is there that, right? And you could literally find out yourself whether an exercise has high value or not. So can an EMG study determines if an exercise is optimal for muscle growth? No. Um, you know, there's a, a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation of what an EMG study actually is, right? It's basically a snapshot, right? But a muscle needs more than a snapshot. So let's just say that I'm going to put my hands together like this, and I'm going to do isometric tension on my chest. I'm going to squeeze together as hard as I can. And you're going to put the EMG electrodes on my pecs. And it says high activity of the pectoral muscle. All right. But you know that you're not going to grow pecs by just holding your hands together like this, right? So that's an obvious indication, obvious proof that, that high activation alone is not enough. You need full range of motion. You need early phase loading. One common uh, error is um, a, a tricep kickback. They'll put the electrodes on the triceps. You'll extend the arm, high activation on the tricep. Some people think that means a tricep kickback is good. I would say, well, it's better than sitting on the, on the couch watching TV, yes. But it's late phase loaded. It's not early phase loaded. You get nothing, no resistance at all in the early phase of the range of motion. You get too much at the end of the range of motion. You can't use as much weight because you're giving the weight to the muscle where it's weaker and you're giving it nothing where it's stronger, right? So you, you will not get much tricep growth from a tricep kickback as compared with a flat bench skull crusher. And you would not know that if you didn't understand the, but the 15 biomechanical factors that determine the value of an exercise. If all you look at is an EMG study, and that by the way, assumes the EMG, the EMG study is correct sometimes it it's 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 not correct or it defies logic what do i mean by that i saw an, an article where they were suggesting that the inclined press showed little or no activation and what would be considered the upper fibers of the pectorals which would be the highest fibers on the sternum and possibly the the the, the um clavicular fibers, that it showed little or no activation on the concentric, but it showed more activation on the eccentric coming down. 
That's ridiculous. It's illogical because the direction of the resistance hasn't changed. And the direction of the movement is still on the same plane, right? So those two things, the direction of movement and the direction of resistance, literally determine what muscle is loaded and what muscle is not. You can't say that it's loaded in one direction, but not in the other direction. It's ridiculous, right? So how do we interpret that? Well, I don't exactly know, but logic, you can't throw logic out the window. Logic dictates that if, it's the, if the same direction of resistance is pulling on something, it's not gonna change where it, you know, if I throw a rope over a tree, it doesn't matter how hard I pull on it, right? As long as I pull in the same direction, the same load will be on the same part of the branch every single time. So that's an example of how we can't trust sometimes what someone claims their EMG study suggested. Here's another one. Um, and, and see, this is what bothers me is, is there are some people that have a credential. They are an exercise physiologist, PhD. And they read a report, a study that someone else conducted. And they, they report what that study said to the public as if it's fact. And yet there's so many parts of that that are completely illogical. And yet the consumer hears the exercise physiologist say, here's what this study. So now he's using his credibility to basically guarantee or ensure that that study was done right. And yet all he did was read it and report it. Okay, so now this is what the study said. It said that this EMG study showed that different parts of the muscle were activated with different exercises, different parts of the muscle, okay? Suggesting that maybe the insertion end was activated more on this exercise and the origin end was activated more on that exercise. And yet, logically, that's impossible. Any rope, any cord, any elastic band, any muscle fiber that's only held on two ends, you know, and is, is being pulled has to have, has to have, even tension throughout. The only way that you can change that is if you grab that muscle or grab that rope somewhere in the middle, and then this guy keeps pulling and this guy over here does not. Then there'd be more tension here than over there. But if it's a rope is only held on two ends, the reason why anatomical movement happens is because the origin and the insertion are coming together and creating anatomical movement. Anatomical movement cannot happen if there isn't even tension throughout. So this is the problem I have. It's that, it's that the person who's reading the report may not have enough sense, may not have enough biomechanical experience to understand what is absolutely physics and what isn't. Physics, absolute physics, guarantees that you cannot create more tension in one end of the muscle than on the end of the end. But this is what this quote unquote EMG study reported. So, and then it, it misleads people. Oh, then I'll do this one for the lower end of the bicep and I'll do this one for the upper end of the bicep. Listen, I've been doing this 43 years and I've changed exercises a million times. And now I do one exercise for every single muscle. And the shape of that muscle has not changed a bit. Not a bit. When I competed last year in the Mr. Universe, the, the muscle shapes I had were absolutely the same muscle shapes I always had, right? Despite not doing all the variety of exercises that I did in my earlier years, because I bought, I drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. I bought what people were saying, right? But it does not make any logical sense. And at some point, we hope that people that have PhDs, people that are educated, don't just assume that everything they read is true. We, I mean, look, this is how I arrived where I arrived in terms of these 15 principles is because there are some things that are just undeniable. They're just undeniable. They're provable, they're measurable, right? You can quantify how much, how little, just with physics.
right? So the idea that you're going to just report and believe something that someone reported because they had done what they, they claim is a scientific study, you can't throw logic out the window. You just cannot do it. And what makes this problem bigger is once those uh, results are released, people start performing those, video, uh, those exercises. And those who have uh, great physiques, you can see them using those recommendation, shirtless, and people will see how those muscles really uh, are pumped and grew based on like what they see. Right. But it has nothing to do with the efficiency of the movement. Yeah. Look, I, if, if I was in, in contest shape right now and I was bigger and leaner and you happen to watch me brushing my teeth, you would see my pectoral muscles contracting. Right. But it would be foolish for you to assume that brushing your teeth is a good pectoral exercise. Now, that's an extreme example, of course. But the fact is, if you're muscular, anything you do that semi-engages any particular muscle might create the impression, even though it isn't the fact that that exercise or that activity is good for that muscle, right? By the way, soreness is not a good indicator either. You can go out, as you know, because you're a tennis guy, you could go out, if you haven't been playing tennis for a year, you go out and play a game of tennis, you're going to be sore. Is that a good way to build muscle? If I hit you on the shoulder and that muscle is sore, the next day, is that a good way to build muscle? If I push my hands together like this for 30 minutes today, my pectoral muscle will be sore tomorrow. Is that a good way to build your pecs? No. These are false indicators. These are things that mislead us. We can't throw logic out the window. We have to know what, what qualifies for a productive, safe, efficient exercise um, based on you know logic, based on physics, based on absolutely guaranteeable things, right? And, and, and you can't then take something that someone claims is an EMG result and say, that's what I need. Right. Okay, I'm going to read you a study here and let me know what you think. Okay. So two group of people performed for eight weeks inclined bench press with dumbbells versus another group who performed an inclined barbell press. They did five sets of six to 10 reps with 80 to 95 percent the maximum rep. The results showed that the group who performed dumbbell incline press showed slightly more muscle growth than those who use barbell. Therefore, uh, dumbbells for upper chest are better than the barbell. So do you think that this study is misleading? And if it's misleading, to whom it's misleading? Well, look, for one thing, I'll say that anytime you use dumbbells, it's better than barbells, right? So let's just get that out of the way. But that's far less significant than the issue of the incline, right? The incline press um, is not a good, quote unquote, chest exercise because you're not moving your arms toward any pectoral origins. If you're on a flat bench and you're doing a flat dumbbell press, if I turn to my side here, you can see, if I do a flat press, I'm already moving toward the highest fibers on my sternum. And when I put my arm up like this, the clavicle angles this way, and it moves towards the clavicle too. In my book, I have a picture of a woman who's very lean. She's doing a flat dumbbell press. And you can see that her clavicular fibers are actually working more. They're more pronounced than the highest fibers on her sternum, right? So... That's the rule is all muscles pull toward their origin. They can do nothing but pull toward their origin, right? It's if you were a muscle origin and you had a rope tied to the other end of a, let's say the chair or something, if you pull on that, what would be considered muscle insertion on that limb, if you pull, that limb is gonna move toward you. You can't make that limb go anywhere else. It's gonna go through toward you. That's what muscles do. So. The thing you have to ask, we have to ask ourselves is, are there any pectoral fibers that participate in an incline movement? And the answer is yes, they do participate, right? Because you're moving somewhat in the, in other words, you're not pulling, you're still pushing, right? And so the front delts are working and the, you know, upper fibers to a degree are working, but they're not working as much. 
They're not working to the degree that they could be working if you are moving the limb directly toward those organs. When you do an incline press, you're moving toward your neck or your chin, depending on the angle of the incline, right? So you're getting a diluted, you're getting 50%, 40%, 30% of the pectoral stimulation or pectoral contraction that you would get on a flat dumbbell press. So of that 30%, you're going to get more from a dumbbell press than you would from a barbell press. Okay, big deal. In other words, you're getting the better of the two bad, the two bad versions, right? If you use an incline barbell press, you're getting the, the, the worst of the bad options, right? Now you look at someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger, a picture when he's doing incline presses and you say, well, it looks like his pecs are working. Well, that's because his pecs are big, but Again, our program doesn't say um, that incline presses and bent over barbell rows and upright rows, we don't say they don't work. What we say is that everything works in a percentage. This exercise might give you 10% of the potential that that muscle has. This one might give you 30%, that one would give you 80%, that one would give you 100%. Moving toward the origin of the muscle gives you 100%. Right. It's all about getting maximum percentage of benefit. Right. So if someone like Arnold does incline presses and he does flat dumbbell presses and he does decline dumbbell presses and he does cables, all of these things are going to contribute to muscle growth. Then he gets on stage and you make the assumption, the false assumption that every single one of the exercises he did contributed the exact same amount. That's impossible. They're all mechanically different they must all contribute a different amount. And the ones that contributed the least, let's say an incline barbell press, will not take away the benefit that you got from the flat dumbbell press, right? You still get to keep the benefit from the flat dumbbell press and the decline dumbbell press. You still get those benefits, right? So when you get on stage, the end result is you look pretty good. No one knows that one of them only gave you 10% benefit. One of them maybe injured you or gave you a risk of injury. One of them was a waste of time. They don't know that, right? So this is what's so misleading is you look at someone with a good physique and you make the assumption, mistaken assumption, that everything they did must be a factor in why they look as good as they look. Never mind the good exercise, never mind the genetics, never mind the supplements. Yes, and genetics uh, is important because uh, let's say if the people did the best movement for each muscle, the response is not going to be the same. You know, some right. people will have like less growth than others. Yeah. Yeah. I had someone uh, contact me recently and they said, I've been using the break 20. Um, and here's a before picture and an after picture. And I've got some progress, but I don't think that it was as much progress as I should have made. And I come to discover that he was doing what I, we were talking about earlier, which is short rest between sets and very few sets. And I said, no, 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 no. Do more sets, longer rest between sets. Volume is critically important. So if you don't do enough volume and you don't get maximum growth, you can't blame the exercises. That's what he was wondering. It's like, well, are these, are these exercises good? Well, you can't blame the, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's like putting a puzzle together. Yes, you've got these pieces in place, but you also need those place pieces in place in order to complete the puzzle. Are these exercises a trend workout? Oh, you mean the break 20? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. Well, you know, I was telling someone recently that, you know, most of the exercises that are trends you know, um, bench press, parallel bar dips, squats, overhead presses. People do that because they see other people doing that and they've been told to do that in their grandfather, their traditional, right? Those are the ones that actually lack productivity, lack efficiency. Do they cause some growth? Yes, of course. Of course, it's better than sitting on the couch watching TV. But um, the exercises that we do, uh, some people have never even seen a scapular retraction. Some people have not never seen the way we do rear deltoids, right? But logic dictates that you would travel the same direction as the fibers, right? It's logical, right? You would move toward the origin when you're doing your rear deltoid. You move toward the origin of that muscle in the most natural shoulder position possible, right? So um, it might become a trend, right? I mean, if there's more and more and more people doing them, then 
Followers follow other people. That's what they do. That's why they're called followers, right? It might become a trend, but you know, it, it would be wrong for us or for anyone who's listening to this to think that they shouldn't do an exercise that, that most people haven't heard about or most people don't know about because you know, you, you've got to use your brain. You've got to use your logic. We explain why an exercise is good. We don't just say, take our word for it, do this. Right. That's what a lot of other people do, by the way. Take my word for it. Like that leg press sitting 45 degree at an angle like that. It's like, all right, Mr. Coach, Mr. Trainer, explain to me the mechanics of how that's supposed to change where on the quadricep. You can't do it. You must be able to do that. You must be able to explain why mechanically the load shifted from this to that. Right. If you can't do that, if there is no logical explanation for why that happened, then you're just blowing smoke. We don't do that. We t- we explain the mechanics. We explain the why. And it's all very sensible. People are complicating working out too much. They are trying to yeah. go different angles. You do this, do that. I think uh, some people get bored, so they have to try. And people to sell programs, they have to show differently. People will say, oh, you also trying to sell your program. So, you know, it's part of it. But at least this program, I can tell you that works because, as you said, it mimics the function of each muscle. Listen, you and I are trying to make a living, right? We're putting, trying to put food on the table and pay our rent, right? There's nothing wrong with that. We make our living by telling the truth. Some people make the living by lying or maybe not lying because that suggests they know what's right and they're deliberately telling you something that's wrong. Some people mislead naively, not yeah. knowing that what they're saying doesn't make sense. Not knowing that what they're saying is, is scientifically impossible. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I don't want to pass judgment on anyone. I mean, I, I don't mind passing judgment on the, the people who are actually lying, who actually know better. Like there are a lot of people that are out there selling little gadgets that couldn't possibly like this. I don't want to name names, but there's this little thing you sit on the couch and you, you, you move your little legs and you move (laughs) your legs literally like three inches, three inches with like no resistance. Right. And, and what do they do? They show like a model and they show the muscles that are theoretically working as if it's black and white. If it's, if the muscles working, it's getting maximum benefit. And if it's not working, it's getting nothing. It's like, no, yeah, those muscles might be working a little bit the same way they'd be working when you pick up a glass and drink your water. But to try to convince people that do drinking water is going to work your bicep and make a difference. No, that's, that's misleading. That is false. That is a lie. That is deception. And, and I am dead against that. So, but you know, a lot of people are misleading people and they don't know that what they're saying is false. They're trying to make a living. They think they're trying to do it honestly, but they're completely inaccurate. I wouldn't mind debating them. I wouldn't mind pointing out the, 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 the lack of logic or the, the lack of science in what they're saying, why what they're saying is false. I, I wouldn't mind doing that. I don't want to get into any arguments with anyone, but, and I don't want to, you know, deprive anyone of making a living, but you know, the poor consumer, the poor consumer is listening to this stuff and getting completely confused or completely misled, wasting time, wasting their money. You know, I mean, this is one of the reasons why our program might not be so commercially viable, right? Because we sell this are the nuts and bolts. There you go. It's not going to change next month. It's not going to change next year. <laughs> this is the fact, right? This is what I say about fitness magazines. Like they have to sell another issue every month, right? So they have to constantly give you something new. Well, guess what? There aren't a million new things. There just aren't. Here's the way it works, period, right? So the next month when they come out with another exercise, they should say, look, this exercise might be fun, but it's not as productive as the one we told you about last month. They don't say that because they want you to believe that it's equally productive. Here's another one, equally, equally, equally. And then you have endless variety. Oh, how wonderful. But it's not, it's not what it seems. 
Uh, I hope people subscribe more to the channel and support us. I will put the link for True Bodybuilding in the description uh, of the video. Okay. Thank you very Sounds much. Great. My pleasure. And Thank I will you. see you next week. All right. See Thank you next you. week. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.